Hey there. So we are on our third week. Where does the time go, right? And, and we are going to embark on Rome, okay? Uh, the grandeur, that was Rome. Um, I think it's important, you know, to, to say <clears throat> that of all these ancient civilizations that we have been discussing, Rome is perhaps the most accessible. Hmm? The most accessible, it has the best preserved monuments, it has a great literary legacy, and, um, and basically it, it, it is really the one we, we can relate to the best in the Western world, Rome. And some people even say today that the North American sort of hegemony, you know, the United States sort of um, power or whatever, or influence um, from the middle of the 20th century on, it resembles Rome, that it's like a new Rome of sorts. Whether that is true or not, it's an interesting comparison and it shows that Rome is still alive and well in people's minds. Sorry about the coffee, but I have to take a few of this, you know? So uh, I need to stay alert. Um, all right, so um, basically, this is all the same area, right? The Greek area, Rome, the Mediterranean. And you know, um, from the 400 before Christ till around, you know, 400 after Christ, okay? You have that Rome, that Italy, that the Roman Empire, the Rome, whatever, it's the most significant power in the Mediterranean. It has its hand everywhere, okay? And it expands its culture everywhere. So, nothing is born out of nothing. What is the main influence? Hellenistic, all those nude men, all those temples, you know, from the archaic, from the classic, Remember, they got telescoped. They got sort of spread all over the Mediterranean world thanks to Alexander, Sikander the Great and his expansion. And the culture of Greece lived on in the Mediterranean until Rome came and Rome picked it up and developed and kept pushing the envelope. But Rome is not just a follower. Rome brings other items to the table. It brings other items to the bargain. The most important thing about Rome, about Italy and uh, you know the Roman Empire, is that it is syncretic. They take things from all over and they sort of like push them through their own sort of prism and they make them their own. So, you know, we start with Hellenistic, but it becomes Roman because they give it their own spin on things, okay? And, um, and basically, Rome is also interesting because they're also very tolerant. To some extent, they're tolerant of other habits, other gods, other religions, you know, they are kind of um, sophisticated that way. They don't impose one thing, they're all about the taxes. You pay the taxes, you can do whatever you want. You know, that, that, that kind of thing. Of course, that varies from century to century, emperor to emperor, that kind of thing. But still, it's interesting to note. Um, they, they wouldn't just subordinate the people they conquered. They would eventually give them rights and allow them to set up gods in the capital. Of course, this is also very romantic, right? I'm sure if you were conquered by the Romans back then, you wouldn't talk about it like that. But still, today, with this uh, hindsight, it appears that, um, that they were relatively tolerant. So, when we ended with the Etruscans, I showed you the she-wolf. Here she is, the she-wolf, the mother of Romulus and Remus, the, bird, the what you might call the stepmother of Romulus and Remus. And basically, um, by 753 or 750, let's do a chronology. So this whole thing starts with the she-wolf on the 
on 750 before Christ on uh, Latium Hill, on Latium Hill. And, uh, and there have been people there for a long time, but these two brothers, they're going to be the beginning of this great city, of this great empire. And um, at the beginning, from 750 to 509, Rome is ruled by kings. This is the era of the kings. And they rule Rome, okay? And uh, in 509, the last king is expelled. He is kicked out of the hill, and we have the beginning of the Republic. We have here a Republic. So we go from 509 to 44. To 44, we have the Republic. And in this Republic, and in this Republic, you know, um, Rome starts gaining territory. Rome starts spreading. You know, they go to North Africa. They're spreading their territory and their influence all over the Mediterranean. There, you know, in this new government, in this Republic, you have magistrates. The mag and we call a judge today, we call him or her a magistrate. So you have this man ma magistrates managing the Republic. At the top, top, you have the consuls. The consuls are at the top, and you have a Senate, like today in the United States, a Senate, a body of people that gives advice, recommendations, and that allows for things to happen or not. Please excuse me, I'm gonna put this off. Help you turn off your cell phones. Um, anyway, so we have a republic, consuls at the top, magistrates manage, and a, um, and a Senate advising everybody. Rome is expanding its influence. It's taken over the Etruscans. Remember the sadness of the Etruscans? Well, they're being beat to a pulp by the Romans. The Romans are conquering them, okay? Um, and so, you know, they eventually start the Punic Wars, very influential wars against the Phoenicians in North Africa. You have uh, the Phoenicians in a place called Carthage. Big war, big investment. Eventually, you know, the Romans win, but it was a tough win. It was very hard, north of Africa. And you know, at some point here, maybe around 130, 130, the Romans have a civil war, an ugly civil war. And uh, you know, a little later on, by the year 46, you have the emergence of one very famous man that we talk about him today, Julius Caesar. And Julius Caesar is part of this uh, system of this republic. He's supposed to be a consul, but he takes power and he declares himself perpetual dictator, meaning I am not moving from here. And so, you know, two years later, he is assassinated, you know, and there you have that famous Shakespeare, friends, Romans, countrymen, I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often turned with their bones, you know. Anyway, very famous character. And basically, during that era of the Republic, right, from 509, 509 after the kings, and until 44, you know, when Caesar is assassinated, Rome develops a new artistic vocabulary that will have the most lasting impact on Western building, okay? They will take the column styles, remember? The Doric, the Ionic, the, the, the Corinthian, the columns of the Greek temples, and they will add and change and make even more variances on those, okay? And, uh, <clears throat> and basically, they add their own things. Now, the Roman additions are substantial. The one most important addition that we have all over the world today is the arch, the Roman arch. The Romans were able to create the arch. The arch is a marvel of engineering. 
they would do it with rocks, you know, like, like this. And then they found out how to put a capstone so that, you know, like holding the tension, you know, and keeping the arch up. Now, wherever the Romans went, they would build an arch, the Arch of Triumph. You have one in Paris today. So these were the symbols of Roman power. We came, we defeated you, here's an arch. And of course, arches were also great ways for water to travel, okay? They have aqueducts on top of arches, grand entrances on arches. So the arch is very important. And uh, one of the reasons, you know, and it probably comes from the Near East. The Persians had arches. It's just the Romans make them widespread in, um, in the West. But so we, we say that the Romans came up with the arch. But then there is something else. The material that we build with today, that even the way we build today, it's all based on one material called concrete. The Romans invented concrete. So they changed, they revolutionized building all over the world. Prior to this, when you look at the Greek temples, when you look at the Parthenon, temples are made of blocks, like kind of like bricks. So everything is very square, Every other than the columns, right? Everything is very square. With the Romans and concrete, you have the potential for curves, for surfaces that are round, for round buildings and domes. Now the Rome, Romans bring about the dome, okay? So, you know, basically, it's a very, very exciting, it's a very exciting moment um, in architecture because you have new materials and new shapes, right? And look at this temple that I'm gonna show you, Roman temple, a little different from the Greek temple. Look at this big building, you know, huge buildings that they built because they had concrete. And when you work with concrete, you, like right now, you look at a building, it's all marble. It's, but that's only the face. You get a thin sheet of marble, you get a thin sheet of expensive material, and you put it in the front of the building. Because what is the building made of? Cheapest material in the world. Concrete, you know, sand, water, some rock, that kind of thing. Anyway. Here's a Roman temple. Here's a huge building built by the Romans. So one of the reasons that the Romans did so well, and they had so many arches all over the place, is that because they were great engineers, architects, they brought water to place. They brought commodities, they brought enhancements, they brought well-being to some of these communities all around the Mediterranean. So, you know, um, the, the, the architecture, was a symbol of power and was attractive to many people because it had some level of progress involved in it. Now, uh, they also have um, sculpture, you know, and one of the important things about Roman sculpture, it's not ideal. It's not like the Greek sculpture, which is like this beautiful God body, which is not really anybody. It's just some ideal of the male figure. With the Romans, because it's about political power. No, this is this guy who was the ruler of this province. This is this emperor. I mean, they're keeping track of who's who. Who are the powerful guys and the character? What is the character of these people in the portrait? Look at this face. Look at this guy's face. I mean, this is not an ideal person. This is a real person. This is a real uh, a person. And you know, they also have paintings. But more important, of course they have frescoes like the Greeks, and before them the Minoans, but the Romans come up with this amazing, amazing technique that is used even today in buildings in New York City and all over the world. It's called mosaic, and it's made up of little squares like this that you put together. And those are called tesserae. Now it's very good to say, very resistant. And you can also put patterns, designs, you know, pictures into the tesserae uh, with different colors, okay? So they, they come out with this mosaic thing to decorate these incredible buildings. And you know, remember one thing. We are in the culture of um, 
of the body, right? The Greeks, the ideal body. The Romans invented the spa, the sauna, the public baths. You would go to a bath, you know, get your locker, put your things, go bathe, you know, take a steam bath, get a massage, and there would be shopping in some of these areas. There would be entertainment. You could watch a play or something. I mean, so we're talking about the beginning of what? Of the mall. They created the mall when you think about it, and there were malls back then, you know, in Roman areas. And um, the other thing, the other, and this is because they can do huge buildings. They can do huge spas, huge malls. The biggest other inve invention in terms of ar ar architecture, the Colosseum. It means colossus. It means huge. So we have the Colosseum. And this is the arena. This is where people meet. This is where sports take place. You know, this is where matches take place. This is like they called, the Romans themselves called it bread and circus. You gotta keep the population entertained. So it doesn't really attack you or try to subvert the government. So the Romans are really very close to us, even in that kind of thing, you know? And, um, and basically, uh, I want to show you uh, this Colosseum, you know? Look at this building, you see it in movies all the time. As a matter of fact, I'm hoping to share a movie with you called uh, uh, Gladiator at some point in the class soon. And then look at this other building, the Pantheon. The Pantheon is like the collection of gods, all the gods, it's got a dome because you can do a dome with concrete. It's a huge building, a celebration of all the gods of Rome. And Rome had many gods like the Greeks, the same Greek gods, but with Roman names. And then the gods from all the conquered provinces and territories that they say, okay, build a little temple here in Rome so we include you in our, um, in our society, okay? So you have this great building called the Pantheon, it's got a hole on top called the Oculus, and it's, it's, it's an incredible sight. It's a collection of all the gods. Now, uh, let's look at some sculptures, and here's the Augustus of Prima Porta, okay? That is the first emperor of Rome, okay? He is uh, in 44 BC, when the Republic becomes an empire, you have Augustus, okay? He becomes the first emperor. Um, he was 36. So this is a portrait of ageless youth, of a man at the peak of his, of his energy, of his power, and he looks kind of like a god. He is barefoot, he is Augustus, and from there on, all the emperors are also called Caesar, in the honor of the deceased, the murdered Julius Caesar. So we have Augustus Caesar, most exalted Caesar. And um, anyway, look at the chiastic pose, coming straight from the Greeks. He has put all his weight in one foot, okay? And he has Cupid, a little Cupid is with him. Uh, he has, you know, um, a breastplate, you know, showing battles. So, you know, it's a really, really incredible portrait showing sculpture for political purposes. Now, this goes all the way back to the Egyptians. The Egyptians did this, right? Um, with the Greeks, we believe the Greeks were more about idealized sculpture. Excuse me. So, as we continue with the Romans, with the spread of empire, look at this Trajan's column, okay? a column celebrating the victory of one of the greatest emperors, Trajan, okay? And at the top of the column, you have a thing called Belvedere. What is a Belvedere? A beautiful site place, a beautiful site, Belvedere. So there's a Belvedere in top of uh, Hadrian's column. Please look at this. And then there is this sort of narrative that goes around the column, you know? Um, and it's called a discursio, that sort of like <clears throat> circling motion. No? The, the other um, interesting thing I'm gonna show you throughout all this are the great arches, the arches of the different triumphal moments of, um, you know, of Rome. And, uh, and here's, you know, and here's uh, 
the different arches, the Arch of Titus, okay, the Arch of Titus, when they defeated the, um, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people. For example, the Hebrew people and the Romans, they were involved because the, the, the Romans invaded uh, Jerusalem, the Near East. So, so there's this history of, of, common, of common engagements, of resentments and of fights. The Romans were in what is now Israel, took over that. And here's an arch that celebrates that. In any case, um, the story continues. The story continues, and uh, we are not going to be able to, to work with the story um, uh, all the time. We just want to say that um, around 4, 460, something like that, the Roman Empire collapsed. Too many people coming from all over, um, no, no, no ability to withstand the, the other invaders that wish to partake of some of the bounties of Rome, and the empire collapses, and that ushers in the Middle Ages. But before um, we, uh, we go there, we are going to then talk about Christian art. And it's important uh, because then it's almost like Christianity becomes the successor of Rome. As a matter of fact, it's called the Roman Catholic Church, which is not as powerful now as it used to be for like a thousand years or so, but it's called Roman Catholic Church because the religion of a bunch of Jewish savages, of Jewish barbarians, of Jewish uh, extremists was taken up by an emperor, by Constantine. And you know what happens when the emperor became Christian, everybody followed. And all of a sudden, the religion, this tiny little religion that was persecuted, that was considered like, oh my God, you know, this Christian, became the official religion of the biggest empire in the Western world, in the Mediterranean. Let's talk about that next class. Thank you.